So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'd like to get started uh, with what brought me into the field of acupuncture. Uh, Ten years ago, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. It's uh, a condition that can be very difficult to live with. Um, and ten years ago, I was prescribed the standard treatment, which was steroids. And uh, although I did find them somewhat helpful, I was suffering from the side effects that we were mentioned earlier with steroids, uh, weight gain, um, moodiness, <laughs> and um, I was also very kind of concerned with the immunosuppressive um, nature of steroids. So um, I found a great acupuncturist, and that acupuncturist helped take me from the middle of the flare-up to really kind of guide me out of it with the combination of Western medicine. And um, I was symptom-free for about seven to nine years, uh, which was really great. Uh, and then three years ago, uh, I had a major stressful event in my life. Um, and as what normally happens when we're under stress, we fall away from the healthy lifestyle. Um, and at that point, I figured acupuncture worked really well the first time. Let's just do that, do that alone. And although it was helpful, it wasn't able to get me past the flare-up intensity stage. So I had already gone into an intense flare-up, and it had its limitations. Um, so I ended up back with Western medicine, and uh, this time when I, when I went to go purchase the medication, my health insurance didn't cover as much of it as it did before. It was $800. So <laughs> more, I had, at that point, I had more motivation to really try to make this work because I didn't want to have to pay that continuously. Um, so I brought together both concepts of acupuncture and oriental medicine and Western medicine, and they worked really well at taking me and bringing me here today. Um, but we're here today to talk about treating pain and inflammation with acupressure, uh, acupuncture and Chinese herbs. So let's take a look at some of the applications of acupuncture and oriental medicine as they're used in China. So in China, uh, there are wide variations and wide applications of acupuncture. So treat cancer with um, IV infusions of herbs that are given concurrently with chemotherapy uh, to improve patient outcomes. And in this case, I gave a formula, Renshen Yangrongtang which is given intravenously, if you can um, imagine that. Um, and it improves the patient's ability to um, rebound from chemotherapy to kind of um, increase their, their outcome, better outcomes. Um, in the case of antibiotics, uh, many of the Chinese herbs can be used to combat antibiotic resistance. In the case of Kushen, uh, which increases the susceptibility of MRSA, MRSA strains, to beta-lactam antibiotics. They don't specifically act as antibiotics, but they do weaken the cell walls of these, of these bacteria so that they are more permeable, more susceptible to the antibiotics. And then there's another case of Huanglian, which contain, contains uh, berberine, which is an active ingredient known to possess different antimicrobial activities and has been shown to have inhibition of viral DNA synthesis with herpes. And then, of course, the last um, example that I give is surgical application, which is probably the most important for what we're talking about today. In China, um, there are anesthesiologists that use acupuncture um, prior to surgery. So um, that should, in itself, give you an idea of just how well acupuncture can address or even block out pain. So when we talk about acupuncture and oriental medicine, what are we talking about? We're talking about a holistic system of health that is more than just needles and herbs. In um, the tradition, there are five branches of oriental medicine that incorporate a holistic view of health. So we have acupuncture, which is the intervention, the actual intervention. We have herbs, which are the pharmacology kind of aspect of the medicine. And then we have things like tuena, which is kind of where massage therapy might fall in, and as well as um, orthopedic manipulation. Tuena is a system of uh, bodywork therapy, you could call it that, 
where you're actually really moving the joints. You're really trying to get to the joints, to the problem, by grasping tissue, by rolling tissue, um, and it's, it's much like massage therapy. Then we have chi movement and exercise, um, which it, it is exercise, but it's more beyond that. It's more beyond spending a half hour on a treadmill. It's engaging exercise, physical activity with focused breath. So um, I know for a lot of us, when we've heard this from our healthcare you know, providers, we need to exercise, we need to watch our diet. And um, I think a lot of us tend to say, you know, we jump on the treadmill for 30 minutes and we say, that's, that's all we need. But um, the qi movement and focused breathing also incorporates meditation as well. So qigong, tai chi, they kind of fall in this category. And then we have the dietary aspect of it. Um, but it's beyond just uh, a static idea of nutrition and diet. In the Chinese and the Asian and Oriental medicine field, uh, nutrition changes based on what you're, where you are in your health continuum. So if you're very deficient, there are certain foods that you would incorporate into your diet to really help supplement that. And when you're in an excess condition of excess pain, there are certain foods you would kind of stay away from. So what makes acupuncture and oriental medicine effective? We're looking at broad diagnostic tools that examine the body's imbalance of organ systems as they relate to each other. So an imbalance of, say, your kidneys would relate to, would affect the heart as well. We treat the branch and presenting symptoms at the same time as the root. So we treat pain and inflammation while supporting the body's innate ability to correct itself. And then we have various treatment tools that we combine together. So we combine acupuncture with herbs, with tuina, and massage therapy. It's also very compatible with Western medicine. So we address the side effects of medications in some instances. And then we also detoxify and taper off drug dependency, especially with like opioid use, which has become more prominent in the media with the passing of uh, Prince, the musician. I know Jamie Lee Curtis, she even um, came out in the news uh, talking about her sh struggle with opioid, opioid addiction. And then we have um, uh, an organization that specifies specifically in detoxification and anxiety, depression, and even PTSD. It's called the National Acupuncture Detoxifi Detoxification Association, or the NADA protocol, which is what they developed. It's a system of acupuncture that uses auricular or ear acupuncture to address those issues. So this chart that I have here, it kind of shows the interrelation between the organ systems in Chinese medicine. Um, and there's some overlap with Western medicine. We have the heart and the kidneys um, in, on the yin side of the body. So this chart kind of, it shows those relationships. It shows where the meridians run in the body and how pathogens typically run through the organ systems in the body. So this is a quote from Dr. Lawrence Ta, who is the director of UCLA School of Medicine. Acupuncture often works to address the source of pain instead of just focusing on reducing the severity, which can be a temporary solution, in, and in this way, it can be a natural therapy to manage and even eliminate common pain issues without the need for medication or invasive treatments. There are two studies that I'd like to kind of share with you. In 2012, a meta-analysis published by the Journal of American Medical Association evaluated acupuncture for the treatment of chronic pain cases, and this was a randomized controlled trial of over 17,000 patients suffering from back and neck pain, osteoarthritis, and chronic headaches. They tested the placebo effect on control groups receiving placebo acupuncture and those receiving actual acupuncture. And the conclusion of that study found that acupuncture was effective for the treatment of chronic pain and was therefore a reasonable solution or reasonable referral option. So, and then the second study uh, was done by the Massachusetts General Hospital in Harvard University. It was published in uh, September of 2015. It concluded that the repeated acupuncture treatments may reduce or eliminate the need for opioids by alterating pain transmission. 
So what is acupuncture? Well, acupuncture is the medical procedure that involves insertion of extremely fine, hair-thin needles through the skin at several influential points on the body. These needles are sterile, they're single-use, and they're disposable as required by law. So we don't autoclave needles in the United States. Needle size, technique, and stimulation, they vary according to meet the desired effect. So depending on what effect you're trying to achieve, the thickness of the needle, the stimulation technique, all of that varies to achieve either relaxation, stimulation, or pain relief. The, the needles do not enter blood vessels and they don't damage nerve pathways. So, um, and painless techniques. This is something I want to talk about a little more because we see a lot of people who say they've, tr they've tried acupuncture, it was very painful, and it was ineffective. Um, there are various techniques that people use and there, there are different philosophies of treatment that you, you might encounter out there. Um, and it's important to find a practitioner who um, you really trust and kind of believes in a painless technique um, system. Uh, patients do also, also describe feeling a dull sensation when the needles are, are inserted, but it's not a painful sensation. So the term acupuncture also encompasses other traditional treatment methods. This includes moxibustion, which we use a smoldering preparation of dried mugwort to warm regions on the body, um, especially the acupoint acupuncture points, and stimulate the flow of blood and chi. We use it to treat cold, to dampness in the body, and we also use it to help uh, breach presentation babies, to correct that. Gua sha is another uh, modality. It's uh, the use of uh, often a tool that we apply press stroking on a lubricated area of the body. We put oil first and then it creates a transitory therapeutic skin trauma that then produces an anti-inflammatory effect, immunoprotective effect that persists for days following a single gua sha treatment. And then there's also cupping, which is a method of a vacuum, uh, creating a vacuum pressure on the patient's skin to dispel stagnate, stagnation, stagnant blood and lymph fluids, and thereby, thereby influ, improve qi flow. We also use it to treat uh, respiratory conditions, such as the common cold, pneumonia, and bronchitis. So these are some examples of um, those modalities. The first one in the top left is uh, the acupuncture needles, that, which you're probably used to. Next to that is moxibustion. It's just one example of moxibustion, where the dried mugwort is actually applied to the needle. Um, there are other applications where it's directly put onto the skin in very small quantities. And then there's also an indirect application method, which is just um, above the skin, so you're not even touching it at all. And then on the bottom left, you see uh, cupping being used. Uh, this is the traditional method of fire cupping. It's a glass cup with um, a piece of cotton or fabric that's lit. They kind of swab it on the inside and put it on the skin really quick. It's not painful at all. Um, but it's, it's also done with uh, pump cups, little plastic pump cups that people use. And then, of course, gua sha in the, in the bottom right. So acupuncture in oriental medicine as it's regulated in the United States. Uh, licensure in acupuncture and oriental medicine is required. It's a master's of science degree that requires a bachelor's degree with science prerequisites, a four-year study and internship. It's a 3,500 3, hour program, so it's quite extensive. And then you have to pass board, examin board examination with 30 to 40 percent of, West of Western medical science coursework involved in that. Uh, the state of California has the strictest standards for licensure in the United States. Um, 50 hours of continuing education are required every two years for renewal. And then a doctorate degree is also an option to go with. It's a three-year post-master degree education with research and an internship as well. And in the state of California and four other states, um, acupuncturists are designated as primary care providers. So that was the video that I was going to show about uh, veterans with post-traumatic brain injury. And this is a quote that came from uh, one of those U.S. Navy commanders. Uh, of more than 20 troops I personally treated using acupuncture, almost all showed marked improvement in their sleep, anxiety levels, pain, and frequency of headaches. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Muir at this point. I guess I would share how I came into Oriental medicine. I actually first uh, came into uh, Western uh, biology as a biochemist and a geneticist. And it was my father, 30 years ago, who had an inoperable brain tumor uh, that was actually cured through acupuncture. Uh, that turned my world upside down, as, uh, and it opened my mind that there are other forms of medicine that I need to be open to. So that took me on a journey of learning and uh, discovery. So we are going to uh, talk about some theories that scientists have uh, developed over the years. Uh, so the first one is the endorphin theory that some of you may be familiar with. So endorphins are hormones uh, produced by our endocrine system and uh, they help to uh, stop pain, they help to create a more uh, uh, internal balance within your body. And so the first theory of acu uh, in acupuncture, uh, the research did discover that there is an in increase of endorphins that move into the blood. And as uh, Dr. Shibuya talked about also, uh, endorphins are also put out when we meditate when we exercise, and when uh, we relax. So the next theory is the gate control theory. This is based on our nervous system. So this theory was developed by a group of Japanese physiologists in 1950s. No, that's the different. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the, mm -hmm. yeah. OK, so this nerve theory preceded the one I wanted to enter into. But basically, in this theory, there are uh, there are large fibers of nerves and there are small fibers of nerves. The small fibers create pain in our body and uh, the large nerve fibers are very close to the acupuncture points. And in this theory, there's only one path. So either the small nerves uh, go toward the path uh, in creating pain, or it can be blocked uh, by the large nerve fibers, which would be stimulated by the acupuncture point, either through needle stimulation or either to toina, uh, massage, or all the, uh, in our office we use a laser also uh, for even children who are afraid of needles. Uh, so this is a, a picture of, uh, you see there's the small nerve fibers and the large nerve fibers, yeah? Going to the brain. So the theory that I initially discussed was the nerve reflex theory. This was, uh, discovered by a group of Japanese physiologists in the 1950s. So basically this theory uh, talks about the, uh, how acupuncture stimulates the autonomic nervous system, which is uh, uh, the nervous system that controls the parasympathetic 
and the sympathetic nervous system. They're involuntary. And what the research has found uh, that the acupuncture stimulates uh, and helps to create a more homeostatic balance inside the body. So recently, the contemporary theory of acupuncture uh, was uh, written about by a Harvard Medical School scientist. And this theory is called the growth control theory. Uh, this theory is very interesting because it is based uh, out of embryology. And, uh, and it's based on the fascial tissue, uh, which is uh, you will see here the uh, the fascial tissue below the epidermis and the dermis. But the research has shown that. Uh, the fascial tissue under our skin is highly conductive with energy. So you have fluids between cells, uh, uh, cells uh, junction between other cells. Uh, so basically our whole body is an electrical conductor. And sometimes I tell my patients, uh, uh, the needles are like battery cables. They help to balance the internal homeostatic uh, fluids, organs, everything within your body. But it's done strategically uh, through the meridians. So going back to this theory which came out of Harvard, uh, is that uh, what I found was interesting is that for all these years, scientists have been looking for actually anatomical structures to try to fit uh, oriental medicine into a system, either the nervous system or the circulatory system or the endocrine system, but it doesn't fit. Uh, some of the points, uh, you know, go to joints. Uh, some of the points and the channels follow uh, the blood pathway, some don't. But they found that uh, the uh, channels follow the fascial uh, layers, which fold upon each other in embryology. So this is getting a little scientific. And this theory was actually based from a scientist uh, who won the Nobel Prize on morphogens. And morphogens are control centers uh, uh, within the embryo that tell like uh, where the hand should go, where the foot should go, which organ should go here and there. And they've traced the morphogens and the lines and uh, it's almost identical to the acupuncture points, uh, which uh, later in life become like control centers. So this theory is still being developed. So last year there was a research uh, on osteoarthritis in the journal Trials 2015. This was a placebo controlled double blind randomized study, which is the gold standard in Western medicine. The conclusion is 
Acupuncture patients had significant pain reduction, greater functional mobility, and increased quality of life compared to a control group. So what do we know about acupuncture, acupressure? Uh, so we know that they have a regulatory effect generally. They raise some brain chemicals like endorphins and substance P, which block pain when needed. And we know that they also lower others like cortisol when needed. They reduce pain and offer a calming effect generally. And they also protect the person from stress damage over extended periods of time. And that's related to the lowering of co things like co cortisol. Um, and they also have a reducing effect on inflammation, both locally and systemically. Um, oriental medicine and herbs and formulas. One of the things we try to stress to people is getting them to understand that herbal formulas are not vitamins and they're not supplements. Although they're not regulated by the FDA, so they're not prescribed, um, that doesn't mean that they're not medicinal in nature and can't be dangerous in the, in the hands of unlicensed professionals. So, uh, according to the classic text, there are three major classifications of Chinese herbs. That first category is food substance. It's kind of, kind of like food grade. It incorporates things like ginger, licorice root. And um, then you have this second category of non-food substances that's kind of like this medium. It, comp it comprises uh, those herbs that are like tree saps, uh, barks. And then in the third category, you have these slightly toxic, even strong, you know, toxic herbs. Uh, like aconite. But the thing to remember is that in any application of Chinese herbs, you're not taking one herb at a time. You're taking a whole bunch of herbs together in the, in the context of a balanced formula. So certain herbs detoxify the quality of other herbs, certain herbs bring out the chemical qualities of other herbs, and of course there is also the concern of interaction with drugs. So. Um, something to keep in mind. Herbs are combined to create formulas, and it's, like I said, it's very rare that a herb will be used on its own without being combined with at least one other herb. Um, and there are different herbal combinations of the same herb will have different effects. So uh, if you cook an herb with ginger, for example, it'll lower the toxic effects of another herb. Um, and if you cook the same herb with wine, it'll increase uh, certain properties, chemical properties of that herb. Um, herbs may be toxic on their own, but like I said, when paired in the basis of a formula, these toxic properties are minimalized and the therapeutic properties are brought out. Um, and everything from the harvesting, the preparation, and even the cooking times uh, and preparation times of the herbs comes into play when you start to look at their um, medicinal properties and also toxic toxic um, natures. So when we look beyond the scope of active substances with Chinese herbs, um, in, Western in Western medicine, we, they kind of isolate the medicinal substance from the herbs, and, and that makes for very powerful strides in, in medicine. However, um, in I isolating those high potency and um, high concentration, it really makes for some undesirable side effects. So uh, take the case of aspirin, which is a chemical derived from willow bark. Um, aspirin has been linked to kidney failure in high concentrations, but not willow bark. So there are these other um, properties to willow bark that help balance that out. And that also occurs with things like opioids as well, or um, uh, cocaine is, is one of those things too. Like in its natural form in the leaves when they're chewed, um, the uh, addictive properties aren't quite there when you strip it away, process it into, say, like a powder. Uh, Huang Lian, which um, is another herb of ours, it has antibiotic properties and doesn't kill intestinal flora. So it's like an antibiotic, but it doesn't have the side effect of offsetting intestinal flora. So um, in appreciating the science behind these herbal formulas, um, like to remind people that it takes years of study, knowledge, and prep, knowledge of preparation, sourcing, of the drug interactions, of the, of the toxicities of these herbs. They should be recommended, we don't say prescribed, they should be recommended by a licensed professional, a licensed acupuncturist or physician with extensive knowledge. 
um, of Chinese herbs. And the herbs are not regulated, like I said, by the FDA, but that doesn't mean they can't be dangerous. Um, in the case of an example, ma huang, which is a very core uh, herb in our pharmacopoeia. Um, apparently, a health, health food, com health supplement companies caught wind that ma huang uh, helps with uh, weight loss by increasing the heart rate. And so that was pumped into a whole bunch of supplements uh, and people started having heart problems. So it started causing heart problems. The FDA came down hard on Ma Huang and um, it kind of stresses the importance to understand these herbs. Uh, this was fairly recent. This is in 2015. There was a Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Dr. Yo Yo Tu, who is uh, from the China Academy of Traditional Chinese Medicine in Beijing. Uh, she was the first herbal scientist to win the Nobel Prize in Medicine, uh, proving that artemisinium, artemis, sorry, in, in the Chinese herb um, sweet wormwood, was effectively um, it treated malaria effectively. So it was it was pretty, uh, pretty big stride because it also you know proved that there were extremely low side effects. Um, so what? How does oriental medicine kind of classify, kind of understand chronic inflammatory diseases? They, it believes that the root cause of inflammatory diseases is a deficiency that's brought on by exhaustion of the body's resources. So much like what Dr. Shibuya was saying previously, when the body's exhausted, when it's stressed out, it leaves it susceptible to pathogenic influences. And these pathogenic influences brought on by deficiency uh, manifest in symptoms of like heat. We call it heat, dampness, and wind. They're basically different terms that are used to kind of describe inflammation. Uh, these pathogenic influences can be due uh, to external, meaning um, external exposure to toxins, or also internally triggered events like uh, diet or nutrition, and stress as well. So the situation is very complex when we try to treat it in Chinese medicine because it creates this condition of deficiency where the body is extremely exhausted from um, the, these stressors and then also excess where you have excess things like pain, heat, um, and uh, like redness, things like that. Genetic factors are believed to influence um, that are that are associated with these conditions, uh, they come from a concept of they call Jing deficiency. So uh, genetic predisposition comes from uh, what you're born with, but also the stores of what you're given from your parents. So it's kind of very similar. Uh, pain and inflammation. Uh, so when we talk about acupuncture treatments, uh, acupuncture treatments for pain, it's an ongoing treatment process. In the beginning, you'll expect to have more frequent um, treatments of one to two times per week, maybe even greater in some cases. I know in cases of stroke, we prefer to see people on a daily basis um, for those first two weeks. It's a critical window to try to minimize the long-term effects from that stroke. Um, and then we talk about maintenance visits that are more one to two times a month. And depending on how well a person is incorporating the holistic lifestyle, we can then just see them as needed for flare-up flare uh, periods. And these acupuncture sessions are always in concurrent with herbal therapy, so the herbs that address pain as well as inflammation. So you're getting a, me a medical treatment to treat the pain, but then you're also taking Chinese herbs to kind of prevent and keep the pain at bay. Um, and then lifestyle changes as well, diet, active breathing, exercises, meditation, tui na, massage therapy, all these things come together in the holistic model to really address pain. So keys to successful outcomes. Uh, a patient has to be an active participant in their health goals. So it's not a matter of um, coming to an acupuncturist to have them fix you. It's about having, walking with the acupuncturist to maintain your health and meet your health goals. So it's important to remain consistent with the acupuncture treatment plan, um, at least six consecutive sessions, and then consistent with the herbal formulas, taking them as not prescribed, <laughs> as recommended. Um, and then therapeutic levels of the herbs, they take a while to build up. So um, it's not as simple as taking an herb and having an immediate effect like you would with, uh, like say, aspirin. 
That's why the acupuncture sessions are key because they provide the immediate relief and the herbal therapy helps uh, with the long-term health goal. Uh, lifestyle changes and dietary changes and exercise as we were stressing before. So um, if you're interested in some literature and some um, reading materials to learn more about acupuncture, acupressure, and things like that, uh, these are some, some really good books. I recommend uh, The Spark of the Machine by Daniel Cohen. Oh, the Spark of Medicine. The Spark of Medicine, I'm sorry. And then uh, Principles and Practice of Contemporary Acupuncture. Those are really great um, resources. And then this is a quote um, from Bruce, Dr. Bruce Robinson. He was uh, one of the teachers at one of the colleges that um, Dr. Muir spoke at. He's a retired cardiovascular surgeon. And um, he also was the professor, a, pro a professor at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. He said that Chinese medicine is the oldest continuously practiced literate professional medical system in the world. Many of the most thoughtful people in healthcare have been pondering how these two great paradigms, Western medicine and Oriental medicine of healing, can be brought alongside one another for the ultimate benefit of those who are sick. Um, I think many times people get caught up in either or. It's either Western medicine or Eastern medicine. Uh, but the truth is they both do different things very well and they both have uh, their limitations. So it only makes sense that bringing them both together makes for a much stronger medicine. And in my case, that definitely certainly was the case. And then we'll be available for questions. Yeah, it's about the person you know, with regarding, for example, UTI. Uh -huh. And according to that, uh, the, the doctor prescribed a low dose of antibiotics forever, mm -hmm. definitely. So this one, whatever you have, how you pronounce this, Wang Liang. Huang Liang. So it doesn't kill your intestinal flora. Okay, so the question was, uh, someone has a friend who has a UTI, in fact, a UTI, they were prescribed uh, antibiotics. Right, and uh, you wanted you were asking about the nature of Huanglian, the herb that we mentioned yeah, earlier. In this case, um, I I couldn't say one way or another without actually seeing without we without evaluating this person, but um, I would say that um, from what I've from what I've experienced, what we've seen in our clinic, uh, combining the two is important would be very very beneficial. Yeah, in some cases, in some cases, that's not the case for everyone. Uh, but it also highlights another important um, issue of hearing something and then going out and trying to bring that into your life without being under the, the supervision of an acupuncturist. Yes, I, I would recommend um, seeing an acupuncturist, yeah, before, yeah. Right, it, well, you can, but um, I, it's not a safe way to go about it, yeah. Yes, back. Okay. The, the slides mentioned several times that acupuncture reduces pain and reduces inflammation. inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I can see how by looking and getting feedback from the patient, you can see that it reduces pain. Mm -hmm. What are the evidence that you have that shows that it reduces inflammation. inflammation. Sure, so acupuncture has been shown to reduce levels of cortisol. And cortisol is um, what typically builds up when your body is in an inflammatory state. So it, in that case, you can see the scientific basis of that. So cortisol was actually extracted from the patient? And yeah, in those clinical trials, they, they did blood tests, and then they measured the levels of cortisol in the people's blood. I see. Yeah. And, and also, a second question. So for, for most of us that, you know, go to see a Western medicine doctor, you know, you see, you know, diplomas on the wall, right. a university MD. So, so when you go see a licensed acupuncturist, what do you look for? How do you recognize that is the real thing? That's a great question. So there's a board of acupuncture in the state of California. There's a website that you can go to. It's the, um, I don't have the actual website with me, but it's through the state of California. You go there, there's a directory of licensed professionals, and you can find out everything about these, about people who are licensed. You can find out how long they've been licensed. 
you can find out if there's any ongoing uh, complaints or suits against, these pra against the practitioners. Um, but you could also go to someone's website, or a practitioner's website, and get their license number. A lot of times it, that's pr provided there as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? Sure. Yes. So how do you diagnose somebody that goes to see you? What kind of test do you do? A great question. So the diagnostic procedure for acupuncture, typically, a patient will come in, we'll do an extensive interview, and we'll ask questions from everything from, um, are you having hot flashes? Are you um, sweating at night? How many hours are you sleeping at night? How's your sleep? How's your digestion? These are very broad um, questions. But then we go deeper. We start looking at things like the tongue. So we'll have a patient stick out their tongue. And based on the appearance of the tongue, we can get an idea of what's going on internally in the body. And then we also check uh, pulses. And this is different from the concept of, a, of the Western pulse, where we're just checking uh, beats per minute. Uh, we're checking six different pulse positions at two different levels. So there's 12 pulses um, in, ch in Chinese medicine. And based on the quality of these pulses, whether it's rapid, if it's kind of soft, if it's a tight pulse, we can also tell a couple of other things from that. Oh yeah, and in our clinic, um, we also integrate Western and Eastern. So um, we do look at blood work, uh, blood labs that come in, and um, we also look at medications that patients are taking. Cool. That way we can cross-reference and see what's going on. Actually... Yes, exactly. Yes? Okay, one more question. Yeah. Um, so do uh, insurance companies in the U.S. pay for... Oh, you guys ask great <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, so um, we've been working with health insurance, and that's... Um, that's something you're not going to find everywhere. Uh, I so I would encourage you to seek out uh, acupuncturists who do accept health insurance. Uh, Medicare, at this point in time, does not accept, uh, does not recognize or allow us to bill them directly. But if you have secondary insurance with Medicare, a lot of times we can work with, with those. Um, if you have Kaiser, Kaiser has its own system. It has its own network of acupuncturists. So you would um, go to your Kaiser uh, provider and they could recommend you to someone within their system. Um, and then... What about the medical? The medical? Oh, herbs? The, oh, Medi-Cal. Uh, have, we, have we had in, any Medi-Cal? I don't think so. Yeah, might, maybe not. I have been PO anyway. So, um, I was wondering, uh, according to your slide, the acupuncturist can be a primary doctor? Yes, acupuncturists in the state of California are considered primary care providers. So you they can. Use them as primary doctors? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, give me your contact. <laughs> Don't add to that. Yeah. Yes. Question: what, what would be the difference, or where would you apply acupuncture versus acupressure? Because yeah. About sure. So. Acupressure is based on the similar system to acupuncture, but acupressure is, uh, you're not piercing, yeah, you're not piercing the skin, you're using uh, fingers or your finger pressure to really kind of work with these points. And in some cases, we can send patients home with, those, with that information to help them carry the treatments further. But as far as depending on where a patient is in, in their, um, their chief complaint of pain, um, acupressure could be very helpful, but for some cases of extreme pain, acupuncture, which, which works at a much deeper level. Um, sometimes with in, in intense cases of pain, we, we uh, attach electro stim, so like an electrical current to the needles, so that goes even deeper. Uh, so yeah, it really depends. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me, um, let me let Dr. Muir answer that, because I believe he has some experience in that field, yeah. It's uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Oh, okay. You want to talk? Oh, okay. Uh, we have uh, several formulas, herbal formulas, for trigeminal neuralgia. 
and uh, we have uh, special protocols uh, using uh, the needles uh, for that condition. Uh, depending on what degree of pain and how long uh, you've had, uh, we may usually use an electrical current through the needles uh, uh, to help with that pain. Oh. <laughs> Is that a yes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I think when uh, we're considering it, yeah. But our our clinic in Berkeley does keep us very busy. Um, sure, sure. So we'll be available for um, other questions, and um, if you'd like a card or just want to talk about maybe some resources, um, I'm happy to to do that. Could you Sure, it's uh, Miura Integrative Health it's in Berkeley. Yeah, we have cards, so yeah, please come up and we'll gladly share those with you. So the Huang Liang is not it's like, like probiotics? Huang Lian is not probiotic, it's a, it has antibiotic properties, antibiotic properties, yeah. So you can take them with the probiotics, I mean, after several hours? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely wouldn't, they wouldn't react with each other. Because when my friend took the uh, antibiotics with probiotics, it doesn't work because it kills antibiotics. Yeah, well, they usually recommend in the case of, I know from the Western medical point of view, when you take um, probiotics, they usually recommend um, spacing it out, not taking them all right, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dr. Miller and Mr. Um,